So this is where we're talking about training the next generation of farming, and we are talking about our community-based uh, program called Keep Farming. We've worked in about 40 uh, communities in the Hudson Valley, and in every one of those communities, we've been able to either uh, increase or at least sustain the number of acres uh, uh, that's farmed in their communities. We engage all the stakeholders. It's a long, it's a multi-year process in which our community-based program director, Virginia Kosinki, basically holds their hands, or as she says, herds the cats, and they get this together, and they bring consensus from all the stakeholders of how they can best help the farmers in their region. It's been a very successful program that we're now in the process of putting online so that we can do training the trainers. One of our, our um, more recent thing is what we call our Hudson Valley Food Program, and we piloted that in, with a very fun, actually, uh, very fun thing of promoting hard ciders. So the Hudson Valley has a long and rich tradition of making hard ciders and uh, spirits from apples. And um, that is really seeing a re renaissance, and partly because of the work that we've done in the last four to five years. We identified that as an opportunity for some of the apple orchards that have been really uh, outcompeted by Chinese growers or West Coast growers. Very hard to, to make a living in, the, in just the, the fresh apple eating uh, markets. But these hard ciders, these craft hard ciders, it, it's one of the uh, quickest growing beverages in the United States right now. And we have some very, very fine, small-scale craft cider makers. And we started, we first started off with an exchange from French producers who came over to the United States. We sponsored some producers to go over to France to learn to do some exchanges about how they would make their ciders. <clears throat> and we started something called Cider Week, in which uh, we, uh, all of the, a lot of restaurants in the city and local are featuring cider on their menus and, and uh, focusing around that on the week, and they're all starting to sell ciders. If um, if you guys are like me, maybe the only apple cider, hard cider you ever you ever had was something like woodchuck, and you drank that, and you're like, why would anybody drink that? <laughs> and uh, and that's the that's the last you ever drank any hard cider. And I was sort of like that until I tried some of these some of these uh, really well made craft ciders. It's like saying that all beer is Miller Lite. You know, there are some good beers out there. So that's been a very successful program, and now we are we are taking that template to shine the, the light on other. Uh, other sorts of uh, Hudson Valley products like uh, goat meat, for one thing. Goat meat is a very, very uh, fast growing um, market. A lot of people are interested. It's really hot. Uh, fancy chefs are using it. Uh, a lot of people don't really know how to raise goats. We have a large group of goats and we are working, uh, uh, helping train people how to, to raise goats and we'll be promoting more and more of that. There's a lot of land in the Hudson Valley, just like our Glenwood land, that is suited mostly for goats. A lot of brush. Um, Stock brought his beagles over, and, uh, uh, and the brush was so thick that the beagles were having a hard time getting through, but our goats go in there and graze it pretty much. <laughs> that was really fun. I have a three-year-old, and she still talks about all the beagles that were running around her, her, her feet. So, And we were looking also exploring some charcuterie that we'll be promoting with the Hudson Valley. Um, so, the other thing we do at Glenwood, because we have this beautiful facility, we can sleep about 35 people. We have these beautiful <laughs> old buildings there. We can sleep 35 to 40 people. Uh, we can have meetings up to about 50 people, but we bring people together. So we. We bring people together and we can get them there for several days and we can work on, on problems that we're working, we're working on. We are just going to have uh, very soon, for example, one of the things we're doing is bringing a lot of land trust in from the region to talk about how they can go the next step after they've preserved all this land to make sure that it stays in agriculture. 
which you would think that they would have thought of that already, and some of them have, but there's still a lot of people are preserving land and not knowing what they're going to do next. So that's, um, that's I think, a very important. This is just my contact information, and I just will give you a little bit more of an overall background. What we say our mission is at Glenwood, uh, to distinguish it from a lot of other organizations, is we really say that our work is really with the trade, and the trade is broadly defined as <coughs> farmers, chefs. For example, we just uh, are now the new home of the James Beard Foundation Chef Boot Camp. So they came, a lot of selected chefs came last fall. They processed animals, they killed chickens with us. These very, I mean, very well-known chefs were out on our farm doing some work, processing animals, learning a lot about what it means to actually procure uh, food from a farm. So policy makers, we are training people that in the trade, uh, even the press, that want to know more about farming. This, this is really our audience, a little less about public education, although we inevitably do some of that just from people coming onto our site to buy the stuff that we, we produce. So with that brief overview, I want to tell you more about what I really came to talk about, which is our this very uh, ambitious and large new project that we are launching uh, in conjunction with one of those land trusts, Open Space Institute, which is a very large uh, land trust space, uh, on, in, mostly in the East Coast. Um, they happen to be our landlord at Glenwood. So they own the land that we uh, have at Glenwood because the family <coughs> gave, had, had um, sold that land to them at a very uh, subsidized price so that it can be conserved. And then we rent the site from, uh, from Open Space Institute for a dollar a year because it costs us a lot to maintain. Um, so we all know in this room the barriers to new farmers coming in to farm. Historically, it used to be the farmers that went into farming were the people that grew up on a farm. And so they learned to farm uh, by growing up on a farm. They inherited some land from their, from their father or uncle or somewhere, and that's pretty much the next generation of farmers. That system, at least in the Northeast, is breaking down. It has broken down because land prices are, are, are almost uh, make farming inaccessible for most young people that don't happen to inherit a farm. There are not very many of those. Um, there are lots of other issues, though. The good news is there are a lot of dynamic and talented and amazing young people who want to be farmers, but they don't have all of that background. So a lot of things have started to happen in the Northeast to sort of address that. There are some very robust apprenticeship opportunities all over the Northeast. People, these young people will come and they'll do apprenticeship. Maybe they'll start with an academic year apprenticeship. Then they'll go to maybe a year-long apprenticeship. Maybe two or three of those in, in, in succession. Maybe they'll get a job as an assistant manager somewhere. But when they want to make that next step to having their own place, the barriers are pretty intense. And it's also true that a lot of apprentice, apprentice programs don't completely prepare for your own business. I think I was talking to a gentleman before we came here and, and, and he was saying, oh yeah, a lot of people knew how to milk cows, but they didn't know anything about the business. And we do find that a lot. Uh, they can go through a lot of apprenticeships, but not really still have the nuts and bolts uh, business experience that they will need. Access to capital is a very, very difficult thing. We all know that um, agriculture is a capital intensive program. So what we have, are launching um, in New Falls, which is on the west side of the river, about 45 minutes north of us, uh, Open Space Institute recently preserved uh, about 500 acres of these iconic lands at the Sh uh, Shawangunk Mountain foothills. It is an amazing, beautiful land. And we are launching the, our Hudson Valley Ag Incubator there. 
And that is a, we have housing there, we have infrastructure there, we've uh, partnered with OSI, we've had some, we've raised philanthropic money to do this. And what that is, and some, uh, may, many of you in this room, since you are kind of uh, knowledgeable about ag, may have heard about agricultural incubators, but for those of you that haven't, it's a, it's a concept that's very well accepted in high tech, biotech, those are the things where people get incubated. They have a lab space, so they have um, sort of subsidized space so that they can start their businesses. And that's what an ag incubator will do as well. There are a few of them in the country. I, some of you may have heard of Entervale in Vermont. It's 40 acres, it's very small, but they have been somewhat successful in incubating some businesses. The problem is that no one ever leaves there, and so they don't really have a lot of new new places to um, to offer to people. So our incubator will offer uh, access to land, access to capital if they need it, housing if they need it. They will get, um, again, very thought out curriculum. So every one of our entrepreneurs that we say will go through a very set curriculum over, the, over their three year uh, 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 term on our land. They will get one-on-one -on -one business mentoring. They'll get one-on-one -on -one farm mentoring. Everybody will have business and farming mentoring. And, um, and, and we hope that at the end of the day, in about three years, they will be ready. They have proven their business. They'll be ready to fledge off into the next opportunity. And this is what makes, this is the part of it, I think, that makes our incubator unique in this country because we are partnering with the land trust. We're saving farms all the time. One of the reasons that Open Space Institute wants to work with us is that they want to find vetted farmers that they can then transition to some of this ag land that they have been preserving either with secure long-term leases or lease to buy arrangements and open spaces doing some pretty innovative stuff about how they are doing lease to buy. They're doing um, some systems, for example, where farmers only pay mortgages uh, half the year when they have money for that. So they're making it really easy. We like to, uh, we like to sort of like explain this a little bit by walking you through what we think might be like the ideal scenario, the, how this system might work. So the first thing that you know is that we're not giving everything to people, that we want them to have some skin in the game. So they will have to pay a, a small stipend to us. It's a, a fraction, but it's enough. We want people engaged enough. Uh, so if they're renting, if they have access to land from us, and they have access to infrastructure, and they're doing housing, I think they will pay us around $4,000 a year for that opportunity. They will also have to come with enough capital and a way to make money uh, to support themselves while they're starting their businesses. So let's, we'd like to go through Jane's chickens. So let's say how this might work. So Jane will come to us with a business not necessarily have to be a business plan yet, but out of all of these business proposals, all of these people that will apply to us, we will be accepting three every year. And we accept, expect them to be on the site for three years. So we might have as many as nine at any given time. So let's say Jane has this great idea of doing pasture raised chicken. She has a business proposal. Uh, we think that she has the knowledge she needs to have, we think she could possibly succeed. So Jane will enroll in our program. So what Jane will have to come with is enough capital to get the equipment that is very specific to her operation. Uh, maybe the portable shelters, uh, portable electric fence, enough money to buy um, the chickens that she's going to need. Hopefully some kind of marketing plan. What we can provide then is infrastructure that might be shared among all of the <coughs> incubates or entrepreneurs. For example, a refrigerated truck. That's a real necessity for almost all of people to get to market. That's a big thing to buy when you're just starting a business. 
we will have a refrigerated truck for people to use. Bigger tractors and equipment that maybe they only use occasionally to clip pastures and that sort of thing. Those are the kinds of infrastructure and equipment that we would provide. So they're, while they have to come with some skin of the game, have to come with some capital, the bigger stuff will be subsidized or available to them for no charge while they're being an incubate team. So let's say that Jane might succeed beyond our wildest dreams. She develops a nice market. She's building, um, she's building her market. She's building her production every year. Maybe she branches out. She starts doing some value added. One of the things that we're looking at is a commercial kitchen is part of the infrastructure there. Because maybe Jane could take some of those other pieces and start making Jane's pot pies, pasture-raised chicken pot pies. Next thing you know, she might have a value-added business. These are the kind of things that we are looking for and looking to see. We know that not every single person is going to graduate from our program and have a successful farm or go to their own farm. We know that some people will fail. That's the nature of the business. Some people may decide, we don't want to do our own farm, but you know what? I would love to manage Mr. So-and-so's farm, and they will be very trained and very rooted in what they would need to do to manage someone's farm. When they're ready to fledge, that's when we start working with them, with Open Space Institute, other landowners, other investors that we are farming networks with, find that place for them to go to their next business. That in a nutshell is how we expect it to work. Uh, our partners, Open Space Institute, insisted that we have all of the money raised to operate for five years before we launch. And that did take us a year or so to do. But we raised about $4 million for this project. And that is what we think our operating budget for five years will be and we are hoping that the project will be very successful and attract other, uh, other resources as we go along. So with that, if you have any questions of the program, I, I, I always feel like I talk a lot more naturally when I'm asking, answering someone's questions. So if you have questions, I would really welcome that. Uh, and maybe even a discussion that we could talk about. So, are you finding many more young people interested in farming now? We are. In fact, it, it is amazing to me. Just in the eight years that I've been in Glenwood, the, the difference in the quality of the people that we can hire when we have positions open and the people that are coming to be our apprentices. These are like amazing young people. They, they are really hardworking. They're very smart. They want to be farmers. They really want to do it. We aren't taking apprentices at our farm that we don't think that these people are really pretty much committed to doing it already. You know, there are those woofers, there are the academic year apprenticeships, which I, I'm, they're totally valuable, but those are people still exploring the world. When they come to us, they're pretty sure they want to be farmers. They've done a lot of that already. They want to take a deeper dive. We are seeing a lot of that. We have a lot of of young people that want to farm. And we're careful. We're always careful to say not, I mean, we say beginning farmers. They don't necessarily have to be young, but most of them are. Do you anticipate that the incubator will assist the incubatees with distribution networks of markets? This is a very good question because there are a lot of models out there. The, one of the most successful incubators in the country is called ALBA. And it's in, in California. And they have a business called Alba Organics, in which they distribute the produce from their entrepreneurs. Now, that's a very small land base, and some of their entrepreneurs have a quarter acre or a half an acre. These are, and they serve a lot of immigrant farmers, so these are people that are working other jobs too, and this is a second <coughs> income for them. They don't require their uh, entrepreneurs to sell through them, but it's a lot easier for most of them to do that. And that business has become so successful, their distribution business, that it funds their whole operation. So it is something that we see is a little bit down the road, but not right away. There is another whole other project from, um, there's a 
an organization called the New World Foundation, a local economies project some of you may have heard about. They just bought 1,200 acres in Ulster County, which is where uh, New Paltz is, on the other side of the ridge, more in the Round Down Valley. They are launching something that's a little bit similar to what we do. We have been in conversation with them for a long time because we know that we're both doing this. So there are pieces that we'll both take of that, like all of the um, curriculum, all of that you know, set out classroom curriculum, speakers, stuff like that, will be something that we will handle and their people will uh, participate with us. The other thing about all of those training classes and everything, they will also be open to the public on a registration basis and a space available basis. I mean, if we do a chainsaw safety and management class for our people and for the New Economy Projects people, there may be a lot of people in New Paltz who just like to know how to operate a chainsaw efficiently who could also register for the class. So that'll be some public offering that we'll do. So this is a long way of saying that the local economy project, that is a piece that they're looking at, is maybe doing a marketing distribution arm, which we would then work with them. Those plans are a little up in the air yet, but I think it would be ultimately something that would be important. We also have to be very aware of politics in New Paltz. There are nine CSAs in New Paltz. Bathroom. It's a small community. We don't want people to say, oh, you're coming in with your resources and you're going to undercut our local farms. One of the things that we want to do is encourage some of these people to um, encourage alternative markets. For, we, for example, we know in North Jersey, which is an hour from us, the few CSAs there have waiting lists of God knows how long. So it's only an hour away. We might be able to do CSAs uh, in North Jersey. There's a lot of new markets that are emerging, institutional markets. We get calls from schools and hospitals all the time now that want to buy local produce. But they have all of these restrictions. They have to have HACCP plans. They have to have all of that. They can't buy from very small producers. But we have a great resource in Kingston, New York, which is also in Ulster County. Some of you may have heard it's called Farm to Table Co-Packer. It's a, a really great business. And they can do stuff like, um, I like to use green beans. If a hospital wants to buy local green beans, they are not going to be buying uh, a few pounds each from every little farmer. They want to buy them local, but they need them processed, frozen, probably in 10 pound bags. So this guy, can make that service too. So there are ways that we can start to look at other markets that's not just another CSA. We have time for one more question. Exactly. And my question is about uh, attracting finance uh, investors. Uh, there's starting to be more interest in impact investors, high net worth people, uh, in finding its way to organics or, or local agriculture production. But the problem is they're mostly uh, boutique or almost hobbies or CSA type things and therefore not very commercial, visible, and therefore return uh, for the investor. Uh, but that's changing a bit, I think, and we've been trying to follow this. And uh, I'm just wondering what you might do. Oh, I want to ask you if you happen to know an organization called Wholesome Way. Oh, sure. We work with Michelle all the time. And, and yeah. Gus Schumacher, the former Undersecretary of, Ag uh, right. Undersecretary of Agriculture in Clinton here, uh, is a big force behind that. Sure. And we think that they're really showing the way, and I'm glad to hear you know that and work with them, but but do you do anything in your incubator process or training to uh, on the finance side to get folks uh, more financeable in a commercial direction? That's an interesting question. We'll be giving them very basic business training, and uh, you're right that we have a lot. We are working with some of these young investors, slow capital, slow money, looking at how do you do something. But you're right. I I feel like there will be some of those people that might break out maybe like a value-added business, like I said, the chicken pot pie. Exactly. But there's a lot of farming that's a mom and pop aspect. It's really not going to be investable in that way uh, because the, the money that you have is the money that you make. I think where people are starting to look at it is through ag land. So we are look, uh, we are working with a c couple young investors right now that have the money. Uh, real estate prices are still a little depressed. They're buying land, and they're buying land with the idea that they will lease it 
to farmers, uh, they will agree on a price that those farmers will buy it in five years, that is X plus whatever their cost. And in the meantime, they're carrying most of their costs through the lease payments of the farmer. So that's where I think we're seeing right now some new ideas of how you invest uh, in ag is mainly through the land base that way. Uh, I will <clears throat> freely admit that finance is not my strongest suit, uh, but that's where we're seeing some of it. Uh, I think s there may be some business that will emerge uh, with value-added stuff that may be investor-ready, uh, but I think we're a little bit down the road from that. Okay, on behalf of the Philadelphia Society for Public Agriculture, I'll come set you there in our history. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. I'll certainly be around for a little while if anybody has questions. I, I...